You're listening to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast, where we discuss whatever the fuck we want to. And yes, we can put sex and drugs and Jesus all in the same bed and still be all right at the end of the day. My name is Devannon, and I'll be interviewing guests from every corner of this world as we dig into topics that are too risque for the morning show as we strive to help you understand what's really going on in your life. There is nothing off the table, and we've got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into this episode. Dr. Edward Smee, the founder of the Soul of Caregiving Coaching Practices, an in-demand speaker, coach, and author of the Soul of Caregiving, a caregiver's guide to healing and transformation. It's a very unique episode. Edward and I come at caregiving from a unique perspective with the focus being on giving the care advice to the caregiver. Y'all, the passive fatigue and burnout are real, and I'm happy to have an expert here with me today to tell you everything about it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. My name is Devannon. I'm your host. I have with me here today Dr. Edward Smink. He is the author of a I'm going to say a, a very polarizing book called Soul of Caregiving, A Caregiver's Guide to Healing and Transformation. This book here talks about what I consider to be a most taboo topic because it deals with the pains and the grievances that people go through, not because of problems they're going through necessarily, but because of the problems a loved one is going through, particularly in the area of health. And so that's what we're going to talk to today. You know how we can beat ourselves up, tell us, tell ourselves we've never done enough. You know, when they die, what more could we have done? So on and so forth. And through caring for somebody who's not well, we forget to take care of ourselves. And so, so Dr. Smink's website addresses that in depth as to does this book we're going to talk about today. So Dr. Smink, how are you? I'm doing very well. And I appreciate this opportunity to talk about self-care and, and how to prevent compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Absolutely. And so tell us, you know, a little bit about like your educational history. You know, you are a doctor. Tell us like, you know, where you went to school, what kind of doctor exactly. And so. Well, I have a doctorate in dip psychology which focuses on trying to understand a person's willingness to deal with their life, to deal with their soul. And I use the word soul in the sense of that inner energy that's within each person. I, I think of the, the painting in the Sistine Chapel where you have the divine God, the Father, reaching out to Adam, and there's that sense of touching each other that somehow we allow ourselves to get in touch with that sacred part of who we are. And in that space, we're able to make appropriate choices and decisions. So I used to belong to a community of brothers that work for healthcare. I have a background in nursing. And then I became a chaplain and I, I worked a lot with the different ethical and, 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 and spiritual issues that both families and and caregivers and patients' experience, and I could I could talk more about that. And then I, after I got a bachelor's in in nursing, I then got a master's in counseling psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute, and and I used to work full time also. So. I worked full time and I also got my master's and I don't know how I did it, but I did it. And I then started doing coaching and I started working in, in executive leadership in, in healthcare, working with mission and values, which has to do with organizational, organizational development. And, and then I also worked with ethics. I was on ethics committees. I was on developed ethics committees and dealt with death and dying, dealt with hospice, dealt with the issues that most family members face when a loved one becomes ill. And then I also worked in community health, trying to 
being a presence in the community, our healthcare system to give back to the community in helping them with, with different health issues. So I got a, a master's in, in counseling psychology. Then I got a PhD, another master's in a PhD in depth psychology. And that's where the doctor comes from. My doctoral thesis was the folds of affliction, the heroic journey of healing. What happens to a person when they're ill and what resources do they use to help them get in touch with that curative part of their, that's happening or to help them deal with the, the dying process. That's sort of my background and uh, I sound younger than I am and I, I like that. Most people think I'm about 10 or 15 years younger than I am and I like that too. And I often say, if you could only see me now, but anyway, I have a passion to reach out to caregivers. And then I explain who are the caregivers. And I say, we all are because at the heart of being human is to care. Parents care for their children. Spouses care for each other. Educators care for their pupils. First responders and police officers care for the people they work with. We're all, we're all caregivers. It's not just in the medical field of doctors and nurses and, and, and therapists. So because we all care, the, the danger is that we don't care for ourselves. We're, 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 I think there's a phrase that's easier to give than receive. And, and so we're, we're used to always wanting to give, but we don't use those same skills to take care of ourselves. In the, in the Hebrew scripture and then also in the Christian scriptures, it says, you know, love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, and all your being. And then it says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And now here's the question. Have we grown up with a healthy respect of loving ourselves? We usually think we're not good enough. Or what, because of culture or our different political aspirations, we don't feel that the gift that we are it, it, in most spiritual traditions, as 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 a child of the divine, we don't we don't let that sink in and realize how how special we are. So you're special, and I'm special. The, everyone who's listening is special, and when we allow ourselves to experience that specialness, we're able to make appropriate decisions to care for ourselves. Right. So. Thank you for uh, the, that, 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 that thorough breakdown of, you know, well, I guess you, I guess you answered the other question I was going to ask you about like why you wrote the book, you know, that I think you, I think you covered that already. So thank you for that. But you mentioned that, that, you, that you do coaching. So I'm curious, like what, what sort of coaching do you do and what is it that you help people gain? Well, I work mainly with caregivers and again, who are they? So the, we're all caregivers. So what I really try to focus on a person who is experiencing compassion fatigue, and I'll explain that in, in, in also burnout, I'll explain that you hear that a lot. I try to have them focus on their strengths, not on the problem that they're dealing with. So what are the strengths that you have? And when we, we focus on our own interior strengths, then we're able to separate the issue that's, that we're dealing with. We're able to pull it apart. We're able to make appropriate choices because we have a foundation. But what happens with compassion fatigue is that we, we're so exhausted, we lose our bearing. You know, we're, we're on board and, and we need to get back to the center of things. So compassion fatigue happens because we love what we're doing but, and we get exhausted. We so just we're, love so, what we're doing. So, so it's a mixture of love and exhaustion. Before, before we get too much into the definition of compassion fatigue, I want I wanted to hang on to the, into the coaching. So you know, his, his, his website is soulofcaregiving.com. You can book counseling, coaching sessions, counseling sessions there and get more information there. He's a very interesting blog on the website. And of course, you know, the book, Soul of Caregiving, a caregiver's guide to healing and transformation. 
can also all be bought through that website. So do you, can you give me an example of like a client that you were working with, like what their issue was and how you helped them to overcome that issue and then what, how they were after you helped them to overcome? Well, I can think of one in particular who was an executive leader in, in nursing and she always, always got in trouble because she was, she wasn't taking care of herself. And, and she came to me and, and she said, I, I think I'm, I'm going through burnout. And I, so we started talking about it and over a course of six months, and sometimes it takes longer, she was able to focus on how she can get out of the trap that she knitted herself into. She didn't realize that she was like a, a, a hamster in a wheel that was constantly going, going, spinning and spinning and spinning because she was always so directed to take care of others. And she learned that from her mother who was a nurse. And so she, she always thought she had to push and push and push and push and push and never took time for herself. So that realization took time for her to own it and not to feel selfish or not to feel guilty. Oh, well, I'm guilty because I'm, I'm, I'm taking a three day weekend or I'm guilty because my husband and I are going for a trip or we're leaving the children with our grand, with our parents. It, it's like, it is, it's, and I had another client who, who felt she was selfish, you know, and I said, look at, and I told this other client, I said, look at what you've done, what you've done for others. How can you say you're selfish? This other client was taking care of her father with Alzheimer for two years until he died. And I said, look at all you've done. How can you say you're selfish? And she realized that she wasn't selfish to take care of herself, but it took a long time for her to say it's okay. So coaching takes time. It's not, it's not like, you know, you're knocked off your horse and, and, and you get insight, you get insight and then you have to apply it. You have, it, it, it you have, it's like a muscle. You have to massage it. Right. And, so when it, when it comes to the to the caregivers and the caretakers that well, there was a, st a statistic that, that I read that it says like in 2020, 23% of American caregivers said caregiving had made their own health worse. And that's according to the AARP, you know, and I was reading it, you know, you know, and it also elsewhere said, you know, that care caregiving is like the growing crisis that everyone must face. I think we saw this a lot. You know, when COVID hit and then the nurses and everything, you know, they started quitting and, you know, there was a lot of burnout and like and fatigue and stuff like that. So did you see an, an influx of, of, I guess, customers or patients during COVID or how, how, from your view, has COVID impacted the subject at hand? Well, COVID affected us all in many ways. And I think the main reason was it. The normal that we knew became non-existent. So most of us were going through a sense of grieving. We were going through a sense of loss. We were going through anxiety because we wanted to get out and do things. We wanted to get back to normal. I remember two years ago, I was going to have a, a birthday party for my brother and myself. We're twins. And that's when COVID started. And I remember saying to my, my cousin, well, this will be over in a week or two and we can get on with it. Well, two years later, you know, we're, we're, we're emerging out of our tunnels. But I think what most people faced was themselves. They, they had to deal with issues that all of a sudden popped up that they couldn't run away from. And, and so that some were able to cope with that and some weren't. 
I think it also helped people become more reflective. You know, after you can't, I mean, how many movies can you watch it, you know, and all of a sudden you're realizing that you have time to read, you have time to focus, you have time to write, you have time to journal, you have time to read that book you've always wanted to. You have time to spend with your family in ways that you didn't. And so it, it, it forced most of us to deal with personal issues that often were hidden. And so there's a recovery, they call it now post COVID, you know, relief, how, how to, how to help clients or how to help each other realize we could put our feet back in the water, but the water is different than it was two years ago. <laughs> See, that's, that's, that's what's different. And so we're creating a new normal that's different because we're different. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I concur. People did have to face themselves. I think that that is like the greatest benefit of COVID. I don't know if it sounds, you know, oxymoronical to associate benefits with COVID, but I do, because I felt like personally a lot of good came out of it. And one of the greatest things was, like you said, causing people to face themselves because people could not go and bury their reality and activities or bury their pain and activities. You know, they had to actually deal with life on life terms and deal with life as it is rather than to be to cater to distractions exactly exactly and it 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 challenged all of us and and some people did better than others in mm -hmm. coping and others you know got really depressed yeah or acted out in their own ways <laughs> so yes we do <laughs> all right so so then let, let me bring this back around then to the compassion, fatigue, and burnout. Go ahead and explain to us, you know, what those two are. Well, compassion fatigue has to do with doing something we love. We really love being a parent. We really love being a spouse. We really love teaching or we love nursing or we love being a, a, a first responder or police, we love, we love, we love what we do, but we get exhausted. And because we get exhausted, it's called compassion fatigue because we're so compassion, we get fatigue. And the antidote to that is called compassion resilience that we're able to step away from a situation and, and, and not, not depersonalize ourselves from it, but to build a safety net and boundaries that we could weave in and out without getting totally absorbed in, into, into the situation. So that's, that's what compassion fatigue is. Burnout has to do with being in a situation. It could be, as you said, the danger of being a caregiver at home and feels feeling stuck and no one's helping me. And I could talk about that in a little bit. And so you, you, you lose hope. You don't get the emotional, let's say a wife is taking care of her husband who has Alzheimer's. She doesn't get the same satisfaction of the relationship that she had before. So she's going through a sense of grieving. And, and she also is, is feels that she's stuck and so or i could be in a, a work situation in, in a hospital a clinic a, a school and and the people in charge do not give me the normal human satisfaction of being there as a person i'm i'm just a clog in a wheel and so i never feel i get the support i never feel that there's people helping me and, and acknowledging my humanness, appreciation, you've done a good job, we're really proud of you. All those things that help a person realize that, that what they're doing is, is who they are and they're affirmed in that situation. When you're not affirmed, you, you feel like you're, you're hitting your head against the wall because no matter what you do, doesn't change the situation that 
the people on top don't recognize you in your human gifts and capacities. So that's the difference between burnout and compassion fatigue. Right. And so thank you for, thank you for explaining that. Another great thing I thought that came from COVID was this gut check that had to come to employers because employers, you know, not always so great. Their employees underappreciate them, overwork them, underpay them, and act like that, that employee always has to come there. When people were sitting at home reflecting, they realized that, you know, life is short. They got their value system organized. And a lot of people who never liked those jobs anyway and were burnt out on those jobs didn't go back to those jobs. And, you know, and now we have like this surplus of jobs and everything. And I think it's the most beautiful thing because employee employers have had to humble themselves down. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> And not think the world revolves around them because they're the one cutting the checks. You know, you actually need employees to make a business run. And so. <laughs> well, I like what you said that, that many people got in touch with their values and realized that they, they could leave a situation. They didn't have to stay stuck, you see, and, and they could, they could work with a corporation on a different way and corporations were realizing that the best, the most important entity that they have are their employees. And, and so how do you make sure that their needs are being taken care of? It, it, it's, it takes, it takes less money to care for your employees than to keep hiring new people because people quit. Right. It does. Absolutely. And hopefully these employers have learned that of the reason why I work for myself now is because I've had a litany of terrible bosses and supervisors and companies that I've worked for. And I was just like, you know, to hell with all that. So, uh, well, something in you, something in you said, see, it forced you to be creative. It forced you to get in touch with what your real values and what you wanted to do. And so that's, that's the blessing and saying, I can't go back to that. I don't, you know, but some people do and, and they, they're miserable. I call them miseraholics. <laughs> so I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Absolutely. Now I'm going to take a curveball here with compassion, fatigue and burnout, because as you were describing it, I'm hearing echoes of relatability here when it comes to romantic relationships. You know, we've talked about like parents, you know, employers or uh, health settings. Do you believe there's any implications with compassion fatigue and burnout when we have like a romantic partner and maybe we've overextended that relationship and we just don't want to leave? Well, I think the same issue comes up about being true to yourself. And sometimes uh, I'm sure during the COVID people realized who are married that they don't love each other. And so they made appropriate decisions. I think that romantically, I often say the gift of a relationship is that the spouse gives permission for the other to be who they are and vice versa. So your, your, your spouse wants you to be who you really could be. And you want your spouse to be who they really could be. And so when you start with that framework, you're on a deeper level than competition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you probably know and heard enough that the way women think is different than the way men think and they're both both right it's just not like one's right or or the other but men tend to look at something from one perspective and women from the other and they could share those perspectives and again it's not right or wrong it's just the fact that oh i didn't see it that way so again how does it how does it come back to normal communication so when you, when you said, you know, no competition, I, I had that reaction because, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with a relationship right now where 
there's this whole, from the other person, like this whole competition, wanting to compare, you know, so that's why I had that reaction because like you hit the nail on the head. <laughs> well, you might, you might, again, you might decide to have a come to Jesus meeting and, and say, I, I, you know, it, it, let's say, for example, this person does something where you feel c competition. That's when you should say, can, can we talk about, I just feel you're competing with me and I, I, I don't want to compete with you. I want to love you. And it, if she's open to that or he's open to that, then you have a beginning of a new relationship. If they're not, then you're realizing that you're in the wrong relationship. Right. Because the, the, that comparison and that competition doesn't work. I was talking with, you know, well, well, you know, we've seen this on the news actually often enough, you know, you'll have like one person in the relationship, be it straight, gay, bi, whatever. And so, so, you know, we, we see on the news sometimes where a jealous partner, jealous spouse shows up at the job and like kills someone, you know, kills their significant other because they were jealous or envious or whatever the case may be, you know, that whole, like, like the comparing thing and the competitiveness, you know, you mention it, but I really want to point out to people just how dangerous that can get. You know, to, to, to stay in a relationship with somebody who doesn't feel like they have equal footing in that relationship, that thing is like a sort of cancer that's only going to get worse with time until that person snaps and does something. You can't stay in a relationship with somebody if you're constantly feeling like you're less than. Oh, I agree. And, and all of us, no matter who we are, I mean, I grew up in an alcoholic family. And I real, it took me a long time to overcome feeling I wasn't good enough. You know, you, from your background, especially from the racial background, you know, you're the way the white culture treats you, you go, well, am I good enough? And, and all of a sudden you realize, damn, I am good enough, you know, and, and I'm good enough. So that's a real transformation. It's a real gift to stand before the sacred and say, thank you for giving me the gifts I have. And, and I will use my life to the best of my ability to live out those gifts. I mean, how many, how many people, how, how many people complimented you today? Well, I rarely leave my house. So, but when I'm, when I'm out and about, you know, not really. I'm the one who finds, I like to compliment people because I understand what that's doing for them, but most people don't give them out. Yeah. But I'm sure you have, you have good friends that support you. Yeah. I mean, when I go around my friends, you know, if I change my beard color or I have on, if I've lost weight, you know, absolutely. They'll do that. They will. I have a friend who, who dyes his beard also. It's the thing to do, man. I can't grow hair on my head, so I got to work with what I have. <laughs> I work with my guy. <laughs> so now, now let me, thank you for going down that, that off the beat <laughs> path with me with the whole relationships and everything. Because, you know, self-care is so, so important here. And when I think about this, I think about like how when my grandfather had a stroke, and then I think he was in the hospital paralyzed for like six months. And, you know, the family had, you know, was keeping going up there to the hospital. I think about various people who have died and they were like bedridden in the hospital. And I can, I remember how tired, like you can tell it in the faces and the energy of the person who was going up there to tend to them and everything. Then when they died, it's like their caregiver it's like they got 20 years added back to their lives. 20, 30 years came back. It's like their youth was renewed. And so can you talk to us about how it can be bad for our health to pour that much of ourselves into somebody? Well, it can be both a blessing and, and a challenge. 
the blessing is I've often said to doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals, are you a better person because of the work that you do? And they all shake their head. Yes, I, I'm a better person because that other person has taught me something that I didn't know about myself. So for example, it is very tiring to be a caregiver and I may not be good with patients. Well, a caregiver or your grandfather taught your family how to be patient. I mean, it just happened because that's what happens. The, the, the person who is, who is the one being cared for becomes the caregiver to the caregiver. So when you reflect on those experiences and you pause and reflect on, on the different experiences, that's what feeds you. When you don't, uh, <clears throat> that's when you get tied up in knots and, and, you know, you probably heard, gee, I wish that person was dead. And then you hit yourself on the head and go, well, you know, how, how why am I saying that? Well, I'm saying that because I'm frustrated. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm tired. And so in our culture today, we don't acknowledge dying. I wrote a paper about that called doctors and nurses don't like to say the D word dying. So the doctor will say, well, your, your grandfather isn't really doing well. What do you want me to do? And then the family feels they have to make a decision whether or not the person lives or dies. 25 years ago, the physician would say, your grandfather isn't doing well. We're going to do everything to keep him comfortable. And, and his, his time is short, but we're going to keep him comfortable. See the difference? The physician, the physician holds, holds the crisis. If, if you have children or, or nef nieces and nephews, if there's something wrong with them, they run up to you, what do you do? You reach out to your arms and you hold them. So caregivers need to hold the crisis. And what happens today is the physician will say, what do you want me to do? And, and the, the family gets all excited, like they're pulling the plug. Well, they're not pulling the plug. The disease is pulling the plug. You know what, what's, what's really happening? And we have all this technology to prevent the dying process, to keep a person alive when there's no out, no outcome that is going to be beneficial. And so that's exhausting too. It's exhausting because family members feel they're responsible, but they're not responsible. The doctor is. And the disease process helps, you know, no one wants someone that they love to die. I call that an apple. On the other hand, the person's medical condition is causing the person to die. I call that an orange and they're both the same. And so unless we address the fact that we're, we're ha we, we really feel we don't want the person to die and address the fact, the fact that they are dying, what happens is it gets all messed up. I call it a fruit salad <laughs> instead of, instead of dealing with one issue at, at a time. And yes, I, 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 I want my loved one to live, but I recognize that they're dying. And so let's do what's, what we can to keep them comfortable. What do you recommend? And I know each person is different in each situation where somebody is caregiving is different, whether it's a romantic relationship or someone dying in a hospice or a kid, or is there any general advice you can give? to, uh, you know, you know, how, how, how does, how do people stop and understand, Hey, 
you know, not, I need to stop and do something for myself. I'm giving too much. Or do you find that people are like resistant to seeking help for self-care in the first place? When well, they, they are. Our culture says that. I, I, in my research, I found out that there are, are three cultural taboos that prevent self-care. The first is to acknowledge there's something in me that I need help with. We're raised to think we have to solve everything ourselves, and that it's a sign of weakness to ask for help. But healing is social. Healing has to do with relationships. And so the first cultural taboo is don't acknowledge there's something in you there's an issue that needs to be further explored and you can't do it by yourself. The second culture of taboo is just as we don't trust what's happening or trust another, we don't communicate our story. So let's talk about, you know, all the floods that have happened here in, in California, all the devastation in some parts of the country, uh, or some parts of the state. And you have first responders that, you know, do their best and, and, and someone may be swept away like a five-year-old was, you know, a couple of weeks ago. Well, that affects the person. And so can they tell their peers, you know, you know, I have a story to tell and boy, that, that losing that little kid really affected me. See, talking about our story is considered also a sign of weakness and, and, sh and to be shamed. You know, we're supposed to handle everything. We're not supposed to share, share our story. But the, the real issue of healing is when we share our story and we're heard, you know, that the other person really hears us, it frees us to make choices. So we want to trust someone that will hear our story. We don't advise, we don't want advice. You know, we want someone to hear us. And so that's the second taboo is don't communicate your story. And the third cultural taboo is don't feel what, what you're feeling. Don't acknowledge what you're feeling. I feel sad. I feel pain. I feel hurt. I feel anger over that situation. We're supposed to have a stiff upper lip, pull up your bootstraps, you know, big boys don't cry and big girls, you know, get too emotional. You know, they're both wrong because being human is to feel. And so I have a feeling over that particular situation. I, and you know, it could be sad, it could be anger, it could be grief, it, you know, but I'm acknowledging that that really affected me. I was working with a client once and she was a first responder and she was, she and her team went out to a, a single plane airplane crash. And when she got there, they couldn't save the pilot because the, the plane just blew up. And so she was distraught over that and, and she started not sleeping well and she started drinking and. Finally, her supervisor said, what's going on? And I think you need a coach to help you sort this through. So I was hired to do that. And so as we're working through this situation, she's realized that it, it wasn't her fault and, and she couldn't do anything. And that was okay in this situation. And she then started getting in touch with going to a group that was called debriefing. And she liked it so much because she realized that in that group, people could talk openly about their experience and that she wasn't by herself anymore. And her other teammates, this was voluntary, her other teammates would, would tease her and say, oh, you're going to the crybabies club. So again, that's the culture, you know, don't, don't debrief, don't talk about what you're feeling, don't ask for help, don't communicate your story. So all those things pile up and, and so we're raised, we're raised not to, to be, 
rugged individualist. Now that's that's more of the the English focus, but the African American and the Mediterranean culture is to go to your family. It's more communal versus versus the white culture that tends to be more independent. So the, the independent person has to reach out for help. The person who who's in a, a, a communal culture has to realize it's okay to pull yourself out to ask for help. You know, that's why I always challenge people. And I, I'll ask people, you know, like, why do you believe what you believe? Especially when they raise a particularly poignant point they feel so intensely passionate about. Whether I agree with it or not, you know, it's not the point of me asking it, but I really want to understand that whoever it is that I'm challenging and probing into like that has done their homework and done their own research within themselves to sort out their convictions. Because as you well know, you know, Edward, a lot of people believe a whole a lot of things, but when you ask them, they can't really say where they got that knowledge from. And I hear that, you know, like say with these, with this nursing situation, I want to say it's very immature for her coworkers to call her, her group, the crybaby group. You know, it's, it's just so sad that no matter how old people get, some people still act like, you know, fucking children. Yep. But, but, you know, but, but for them to, to, to even say that means that they think what you're like, the, the, just like what you're saying is that it's not okay to emote or to express this. Like I would ask them, okay, you believe that this is a crybaby baby group and that this is an irrational use of emotion, but why though? Where did you get that belief system from? Well, you know, what you've already said is that it's a cultural thing. My point in saying all this is people, people, you can think for yourself, your culture, your race, racial background, your sexual orientation, whatever group you identify with. Sure, you got things in common with them, but they don't get to think for you, you know, and tell you everything like the culture told me to do it is not an acceptable answer to me. Well, I agree with that. And, and to stand apart is very difficult because we're, we're bashful. And yet at the same time, we have gifts. And when we allow ourselves to get in touch with those gifts, that gives us strength to be who are, to be ourselves. And we're not, we're not, it overcomes the bashfulness. Or the shyness. Hmm. All I know is that, you know, you know, this, this world, you know, we're going to have a lot of problems ahead of us and we've got to get balanced. You know, you know, the world is not set to get any better. You know, we're, you know, in terms of like our character, it seems like the richer we get, like the worse we get as like people, you know, and like what I mean like that is like when I'm say like in Mexico or in like a, a far less rich country than the United States, I feel like people have greater character. they like an appreciation for one another. Then when I come here back to the United States, I'm all like, oh, fuck. You know, then I got to deal with Karen and Ken when I go out, you know, and everything like that. And it's just like, you know, and I'm saying all this to say, we had to learn how to take better care of ourselves. And then I don't mean going out to buy more things for ourselves or to go have sex with more people or to go like, you know, to fulfill whatever vice you like. I'm talking about like, get to know yourself, you know, who you are, how to truly strengthen yourself in times of tribulation, because trouble is coming to this world. And so, you know, we're going to love people who are going to need our help, but how do we, when is it too far? When do we ask for help? How do we ask for help? Thinking that you can do it all on your own is a, is a trap. It's a weakness in and of itself. It's over-reliance on self. I don't judge anybody for their religious or spiritual perspectives. You know, Edward, you know, I'm, you know, a big follower of the Trinity. I don't follow churches. I love being like dependent on God. I don't like, like many of my friends, you know, like they're like universe people, you know, like, like they thank the universe, they, they ask the universe for this or, or they'll be like, all the answers are within me. I feel like some of the answers are within me, but I love 
being able to reach outside of myself to a being higher than me, because for me, that takes the pressure off of me. You know, I'm over myself. I don't feel like I need to be able to do it all and know it all. I really, 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 really think that, like you said, that there's a lot of weakness built into an over-reliance on ourself. Well, I think it's important. Who are the friends that you could communicate on, on the soulful level? And they're the ones that support you. There's, there was a program about a year ago on NBC. Lester Holt interviewed a, a captain of a police department. And he was suffering from PTSD. And he brought his team together and he said, you know, I'm suffering from PS, PTSD and I don't want to hide it anymore. And I want us to meet every week, you know, at our meetings. And it, it's an opportunity that we can share our experiences and support each other instead of isolating each other. And so he started that program. It was a real paradigm shift. And so the question I ask you or everyone, you know, yes, everything is, could be considered crazy and yet there's a lot of good goodness. And how do you support yourself to focus on the goodness that helps you deal with the tribulations? And so when you have the, your, your network of friends, you may decide we're going to meet, you know, once a week and you're going to have coffee or donuts or, or beer and wine or something. And you're going to discuss it's how to support each other. Mm hmm. You know what? That's a start that people have to be willing to be transparent to do that. One of the things that irks me the most when I think about my past is when I got HIV and that, and that terrible, terrible doctor that I had at the time left my positive HIV diagnosis on a voicemail on New Year's Eve, you know, just over 10 years ago. I was living in the heart of Montrose in Houston, Texas, which is a gay district in Houston, which at the time was like the fourth largest city in the country. There's a lot of people there. I lived there for eight years. Okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. The thing was, I was so, me and my friends were so, we hung around each other, but we never had deep conversations. We were too busy partying and trying to look cute, and we were cute, but we didn't really know what the next person next to us was struggling with. So the, 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 how asinine crazy it is for me to think that I was the only person with HIV, you know, I felt like such a pariah and a leper when really there was many, many LGBTQIA plus people with HIV that I should have been able to feel like I could go to, but because we weren't having those conversations, I felt completely alone. Of course, of course. Did you ever think of starting one? Look at what you're doing now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I started, it's called the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast and Sex, Drugs, and Jesus, the memoir. That is my contribution of transparency to the world. And that's why I did it. Because I was like, my, a lot of my problems might have been avoided if I'd have known that I wasn't alone. <laughs> you know, and so, so I tell everything about myself. I don't give a damn. I let the whole world know because, I mean, if it's just as simple as feeling, you know, if it's just as simple as you feeling like you're not alone from hearing me, berate myself with my foolish mistakes and so be it then honey i'll help you save your life <laughs> and so well i feel honored that you feel so trusting in me to be able to share what you're sharing sharing is caring as they say i don't, I don't care too much for cliches most of the time but i'll use it right now so so some sort of, sort of sounds like you get hired by a lot of like businesses medical places and things like that, like for your counseling and coaching services. But as you said, caregivers are, are everyone. So can someone reach out to you if they have like, a, you know, a kid or a friend or a loved one who they feel like they may be overextending themselves, even though they're not a nurse or a medical professional? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I have on my website how to get in touch with me and, and I do a 30 minute free conversation. That's pretty generous, you know, 30 whole minutes. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot of time in the coaching world. And so. Well, if I, if I had 500 people, I might, I might do it 10 minutes, but I don't have 500 people. Hmm. Well, I'm sure the people you do have love you and appreciate 
the work you're doing in their lives. So as we get ready to close, this is pretty much what I wanted to go over today. Thank you for being such a great guest. Were there any last words you had for the world? Just that if you feel the symptoms of compassion fatigue or burnout or you feel you're at your wit's end because you're a caregiver, know that you can overcome it. I went through burnout 30 years ago and I was, I was, I'll use the word saved because of, uh, of a compassionate Jesuit priest who listened to my story and helped me regain my inner strength to be who I am. And I attribute him in saving my life. So if I could be an instrument to help someone save their life to see who they are and give their gifts to the world, that's what I'm, I'm committed to do instead of being a couch potato. Okay, well, I'm glad that you are here and not hanging out with Mr. Potato Head. I look forward to hearing about your continued contributions to the world. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Edward Smee. Thank you all so much for taking time to listen to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. It really means everything to me. Look, if you love the show, you can find more information and resources at sexdrugsandjesus.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Feel free to reach out to me directly at Bannon, sexdrugsandjesus.com, and on Twitter and Facebook as well. My name is Devannon. It's been wonderful being your host today. And just remember that everything is going to be all right.